Hello there, my fellow fighters of Muad'Dib, and welcome back to some lore from the rich universe of Dune. Today we're going to be covering two topics, but I think they are so linked together that I might as well put them all in the same video. The first half is about the Fedaikin, the best Fremen warriors of Paul Atreides, while the second part is about the decline of the Fremen military. If you remember from my Fish Speakers video, I said I would return to that topic again, so here we are. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Fedaikin, the most dreaded warriors of their time, more feared than even the Sardaukar of the Padishah Empire, considered by some to be even the equal of the Fish Speakers that replaced them. To a man, the Fedaikin were Fremen who served Paul Muad'Dib in the first battle against House Corino in the Harkonnens, and then as his elite units in the Second Jihad. With the possible exception of the Sardukar, no other troops were more fanatical or more skilled at killing. The scant records that remain of the era appear to indicate that whenever the Sardukar and the Fremen Fedaikin engaged in battle, the Fedaikin, somehow, always gave them an ass whooping. Beyond what appears to be the military superiority of the Fedaikin, they had one further advantage over the Sardukar. In fact, this one advantage may even explain why the Fremen warriors were superior. While the Sardukar were warriors who, via a vicious upbringing, had instilled cruelty and pride into their very being, the Fremen became Fedaikin because of their extreme faith in Paul Muad'Dib. Such a difference turned the Fedaikin into fanatics beyond the pale of human imagination. A skilled warrior who is driven berserk by a holy mission will almost always overcome an equally skilled warrior who only fights because it is in his nature. For the Sardukar, it was the fighting that counted, but for the Fedaikin, only victory mattered. Thus, driven by their loyalty to the cause of Muad'Dib, the Fedaikin were almost unstoppable. But, when in 10,208 Muad'Dib was blinded in an assassination attempt, the central reason for the existence of the Fedaikin cracked, for lack of a better word. Unlike that of the Sardukar, the history of the Fedaikin was quite brief, lasting less than five decades. During the final years of the Second Jihad, moreover, it appears that the Fedaikin were already becoming disenchanted with Muad'Dib. Fedaikin veterans returning from off-world battles were uncomfortable with the vastly transformed Arrakis. The old sieges no longer seemed to play a part in their lives, and the court of Muad'Dib was even more alien. The veterans would soon become a source of discontent among the population, and it is believed that several of them played active roles in the attempt on Muad'Dib's life. Such a possibility is certainly not far-fetched, Service in the Fedaikin forced the Fremen out of the ways of their forefathers, and onto worlds they were ill-prepared to understand, and could not understand them in return either. Those who survived the service were changed forever, and the reasons for their sacrifice grew more and more distant, and they must have begun to resent their former icon. Muad'Dib was indeed a logical target for their unhappiness. In the end, however, the Fedaikin simply stopped being, their time having passed. Muad'Dib himself may have actually planned for such an end for the Fedaikin. The army was loosely structured and did not boast a very strong hierarchy of officers. In fact, not a single name of a famous Fedaikin officer remained, a strange fact for an army that once conquered all the known worlds. It would be logical to assume that Muad'Dib wanted just such an arrangement so the remnants of the Fedaikin would have no single organization or center to rally to, once they would find themselves without a place in the Universal Order. Their other popular name was, after all, the Death Commandos. And Death Commandos, once their job is done, are not useful in a world gearing itself towards a peaceful government via political manipulation. Finally, while the chief effect of the Fedaikin was the establishment of Paul Muad'Dib as the Emperor, there was another, more local effect as well. The rise of the Fedaikin assured the end of the Fremen culture on Arrakis. Ironically, the Fedaikin took the youngest, brightest, bravest and strongest Fremen away from their sieges. 
As mentioned before, those who returned could never comfortably fit again into such a life. Thus, it was only a matter of time before the old ways themselves would end. Given the brief history of the Fedaikin, one must hold them in awe and in pity in equal measure. There was never a finer, more devoted army, but their time was brief and they ended without glory. The decline of the Fremen military of a role would take a much longer time, and it wasn't marked by any notorious single incident. The first bit of information to move speculation in this area comes not from the Rakis Horde, but from the Bureau of Personnel of the Padisha Empire, housed on Katane. In its administration of personnel rotation, the Sardukar Imperial staff employed a system of flagging personnel records with differently colored tabs, according to the reason of the transfer. A red tab marked the record of one who died off-world and whose remains were being returned. Black indicated an off-world non-combat death from disease or accident. Yellow marked the record of one transferred home for medical reasons. Green marked the transfer for administrative and general reasons. When the Fremen were organized under the Atreides, this system of the Sardukar was borrowed. With this knowledge, the summaries of military personnel transfers found on Rakis became clear. The changes on the table are instructive that the 4% combat deaths between the years 10,000 to 11 and 10,000 to 20 shows, no doubt, the mopping up of outlying pockets of resistance, where battle continued in diminished form. But after another four decades, in which combat deaths comprise less than 1% of the recorded transfers, the percentage begins to inch upward, 2 and then 3% of total between 2271 and 2310. Two possible reasons have been suggested for this increase, and neither of them are quite flattering. Either resistance cells were being formed and operating, the suppression of which was producing Fremen battle casualties, or maybe more likely, accidental deaths were being falsified as military deaths. The percentage of black tabbed records, showing death from accident or disease, is higher than any commander would want, but not surprisingly so, in view of the high degree of adaptation to the conditions of Arrakis which the Fremen had achieved. When sent to other planets with very different climates and social environments, many of the Fremen did not adjust very well. Disease was taking a heavy toll. The yellow tabs, thus marking transfers for recuperation, increased enormously in percentage over the period, from 8% in 10,000 to 20 to 28% in 10,310. An astonishing picture begins to appear in the first decade of the 103rd century when many of the Fremen garrisons must have had sick calls amounting to nearly a third of their total force. These units could not have been wielded as an effective force. But this decline in the vigor of the Fremen does click well with what we know was happening on Arrakis, as the planetary conditions there were changing. Many other arguments support this conclusion. For example, that the Fremen tribal membership was extended to children born off-world who were acknowledged by Fremen soldiers. The first such recognition was on the planet Zimauna, which occurred in 10,214. The number of acknowledgement and children born of legal marriages to Zimaunian natives increased quickly over the next two decades, and it is among the transfer records from Zimauna that we see, for the first time, beginning in 10,233, folders with a beige tab, showing that the soldier in question refused to return to Arrakis and was mustered out on the planet. The use of the beige tab was an innovation restricted to Zimauna alone, and suppressed after two years. It may be that the beige tabs were having a destructive effect on morale. Supposedly 6,000 Fremen soldiers refused to return in those two years alone, and the folders of those that ended their enlistment on Zimauna returned to the use of the green tab, specified for general purposes elsewhere throughout the Empire. The total number of Fremen who refused to return to Arrakis, therefore, is buried in the mass of general transfer records but their numbers are hinted at in the two-year innovation on Zimauna. The Rakis reference catalog M530 provides another revealing insight into the decline of the Fremen soldiers. 
The conquest of Carillon during Paul Muad'Dib's jihad was one of the most protracted and difficult ones, taking 18 months before the main resistance was crushed. The Rakis find includes the table of organization and equipment for the Fremen forces at the close of the first year of that campaign, when they had reached their maximum of about 250,000 men. According to that, roughly 25,000 of these were support personnel, supply, medical and so on. This ratio of support troops to combat troops, 1 to 9, was unbelievable to their enemies, and unprecedented in military history. The Sardaukar, even at their best after thousands of years of experience, never achieved a better ratio of support to combatants than 3 to 1. Four decades later, there was not a ghost of a resistance on Carillon, nor had there been for 35 years at that point. Problems of law enforcement were handled by local and regional constabularies, and the Fremen garrison was the only military force on the planet. This consisted of only about 3,000 men. Yet this regiment was backed by a supply and administration structure numbering over 20,000. Thus, the support and combatant ratio was now 6 to 1 on a peaceful planet, where the noise of battle wasn't heard in more than three decades. Moreover, the examination of the names on the rosters of the support personnel only shows about 1 in 10 to actually be Fremen. While the troops under arms continue to be drawn from Arrakis, the maintenance of planetary supply, provisioning, quartering and medical service was almost entirely in the hands of someone else. One final and striking piece of evidence will illustrate the decline which all these records show. In 10,221, an interesting legal document made its first appearance. On the planet called Finally, a Fremen soldier sued a native in the local court for assault. The outcome of the trial doesn't really matter. What is meaningful is that a suit was accepted at all. Just one decade earlier, the attacker would have not even survived the assault on a Fremen warrior, or if he had, he would not have lived to go to court. The next decades would see an increase in the number of civil and criminal cases involving Fremen in the courts of finally, showing that the Fremen were changing. They were adapting to local society and accepting local customs. There is no reason to believe that finally was different in that respect from any other garrison planet too. The evidence of the century points to just one conclusion. The Fremen army that had swept in the empire during Paul's Jihad was, less than a hundred years later, a broken reed, top-heavy with bureaucrats, dependent on local support, and often manned by sick and unwilling conscripts. It may well be that its total might decline as well, because Leto never allowed the proper census on Arrakis, and the strength of his own military was a closely guarded secret. Had it not been for Leto's stranglehold on spice, and the monopoly on transportation and communication, the Fremen army, at this point, couldn't have secured even one planet against a determined resistance, let alone hold the empire together. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the mighty Fedaikin and the surprisingly fast downfall of the Fremen military for today. They might have conquered a galaxy, but once the Jihad was done, the universe kinda left them behind. Of course, this could have been all part of a design by Paul. What about you though? What are your thoughts on the decline of the Fremen army? Are the Fedaikin one of the favorite parts of Dune for you? Did you know anything else important about them? Do share your thoughts or questions if you have any in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode and want to support the series, please like, share, comment and subscribe for future content. May the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.